and it's really lovely to see so many of you here, some faces that I know and some that I don't know, but you know, today is all about just sharing, having fun, learning, so we're all doing that together. So I really am looking forward to see what God's going to do today. The very important thing about today, too, is that today is not about information, but it's about transformation. And that's our desire today, is that we'll each be transformed. And even I standing here, um, I'm, I'm expectant that God's going to even transform me even more than what he already is doing. Um, I'd also like to invite you to just, um, just be comfortable. And if there's at any stage anything that God is speaking specifically to you, please write it down in those little notebooks that you have. Uh, with you and just jot down what God is saying to you personally. Very often what a speaker says and what God is saying to you is very different. It's not the same wording, it's not the same sentence, and, um, but God may be speaking something very personal to you today. And uh, my prayer for you today and even in preparing uh, my notes for today, it's all been about, Lord, just speak to each of us individually because we each have our own needs, we each have our own story. And me standing here today too, it's, it's not, I'm um, not speaking to you today because my story is any better than yours. And I'm not standing here today speaking to you because I'm more important than you or any other reason except that today God's ordained for me to share my story. And hopefully you'll also get to share your story. I'd love to hear your story. And God's brought you here today. He led you here today for a reason. And so I stand before you humbly today because I'm just a vessel for God to share a message through. And my story is, um, it's a journey. And each of us have a journey. And each of us are walking in a journey that is personal. But we each have emotions that we share, and especially as ladies. Um, I think that's why it's so special for ladies to get together, because we all share similar emotions. We have different circumstances, we have different experiences, but at the heart of it all, we all want to be loved, we all want to be accepted, and we all just want to be acknowledged and known that our lives matter. And so today, may each of you feel like that and um, be able to share and you'll get an opportunity during the first tea break to get to know the ladies around your table a little bit. So um, when we do have our tea break, please come back to your tables and just get to know each other. And at lunchtime, you'll be able to share with and meet other ladies that you haven't met at your table, if you feel comfortable with that. So... Today I'm also going to be mentioning the word identity quite a lot, and when I say identity, it's not a title, it's not a name, but it's how you see yourself. So it might be a different perspective of what you've understood identity to be, but identity is how you see yourself, and that's what makes each of us our identity very different. So remember that when I talk about identity. And some of you here today may have titled your identity or believed that your identity is mother or wife or teacher or uh, baker. Anything that it may be your job, you may feel that that's your identity. And so when that changes, it means that you may feel that now you've lost your identity. And especially there may be some here today who's, you've been a wife and a mother, and now perhaps your children have left home, and now you're no longer, you feel like you've lost your identity as a mother, because you don't feel like a mother. And there may be some of you here who were wives, and you've lost your husbands. And so now you may feel that you've lost yourself, you've lost your identity. And that's traumatic as well. When you've lost a loved one, when you've lost a partner, when you've lost a husband, it's, 
it's very, very traumatic. It leaves a hole. And likewise with, with, with mothers, when you lose a child. So when we lose our identity, what we have felt to be our identity, because it's a title or something we've done our whole lives, we tend to lose our grounding. And so today, I trust that what I'm going to share with you, and even through my story, that you will be able to see that our identity is not in a title, it's not in a name, but it's who God made us to be, who God made you to be. And that never changes. Nobody can take your identity away from you. God determines your identity. You determine your title. And transformation is usually a process. Let's see if that's good either. Um, Romans 12 verse 2 talks about us being renew, transformed by the renewing of our minds. And our minds, the way we think, is very important because the more we think something, the more we become like that. And that's what Romans 12 verse 2 talks about. So our thinking, the way we think about things, the way we think about ourselves is super important because that develops our identity. And an example of this is the children of Israel in the Bible. You may have heard that story about how God rescued the Israelites who were slaves for 400 years. And now he called them his children. He rescued them overnight. But they, he called them children of God. But their behavior was not like children of God. They were still behaving like slaves, even though they were no longer under Pharaoh's control. They were no longer being whipped by the taskmasters. They were no longer being sworn at, shouted at, treated anything like slaves, but they were still behaving like, where's, where's my Pharaoh? Who, who's gonna tell me what to do today? And yet, God called them children of God. So likewise with us, when we invite God to come, Jesus to come into our lives, and when we believe in Jesus and what he did for us, we get called children of God overnight, but it takes us a journey to learn how to live like children of God. God didn't want to just set the Israelites free. He wanted to teach them how to live free. And they needed to be in the desert for 40 years to learn that. So my prayer for each of us here is may it not take 40 years, but for me it feels like it has already. Um, and the problem was with the Israelites, that is, although God called them children of God, they did not believe that they were children of God. They did not see themselves as children of God. That's why today is so important. That's why our identity is so important, because what we believe about ourselves is most important, because God sees us as his children. He created us. He loves us. But when we don't see ourselves like that, we don't behave like that. The story why, the reason why the story of the Israelites resonates, resonates so much with us is usually because this is our story too. God finds us like a lost, lonely, and broken people, and he rescues us. He's given us a rescue path. He sent us Jesus, but many of us haven't experienced that truly because we've, we've believed it, in our hearts, we've received Jesus and we've received the truth. But truly seeing ourselves as God sees us, that's when the transformation takes place. That's what the renewing of the mind is all about. So do you see yourself as a child of God, as a daughter of God? And this has been part of my journey, is discovering what it means to truly believe that I'm a daughter of God. And as I've done that, and as I've continually been doing that, that's how my transformation is happening. And so that's why I'm excited to share this with you today because we're all on the same journey. And may you also just truly see yourself as God's daughter. So, 
So there's these three circles, you will be seeing them again um, a little bit later, but I just want to point out to you that for us, it's all about receiving God's grace, knowing who we are, and then experiencing his presence, knowing a relationship with him and having a deep relationship with him. And then we will know what our purpose was and is, and that's to release his kingdom. And right in the middle is the Father's heart. So we not we were never called to a religion. We were called to a relationship. And that's where the big difference comes in. So may today be the start of a shift in your thinking so that you can see yourself as God's daughter and your individual journey that God's taking you on to see and know what it means to be God's daughter individually in your life. But that's your identity. You are not a title. You are not a name. Who you are is God's daughter. Could I ask for a volunteer, please? Zara? <laughs> Do you mind? Can you come up here, please? Sorry to do that to you, but I know you're... <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you, can you get onto all four limbs? That's why I got you, because you're nice and agile. <laughs> That's it. And Zara, could you bark for me, please? I can do a puppy bark. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. so good in the video. <laughs> Again, please. Thank you. Does that make Zara a dog? Because she barked. Can you meow for me, please? <laughs> oh, brilliant, brilliant. Does that make Zara a cat? Zara, can you swim? Um, like right now? No. <laughs> I can. Bye. Okay, good. So does that make you a fish? Okay, thank you, Zara, thank you. <laughs> so the point here is that birds fly, cats meow, cows moo, dogs bark, and fish swim. If, because Zara barked, it does not make her a dog. Because she meowed, it does not make her a cat. Our behavior does not determine our identity. So the world tends to say that our behavior and our outer appearance is who we are. So if I dress well, if I look beautiful, then I am beautiful. If I behave a certain way, then I am a certain way. That's the world's way of thinking very often, and we sometimes adopt that, and we, we believe that ourselves. But God's way is that it's the inside, our identity, that then determines our behavior. And that is why if you, are, if you believe that you are a sinner at heart, and you've received Jesus into your life, but you still sin, but you believe that you're a sinner, you will continue sinning and your, your life will probably continue in certain patterns. But if you believe that you are righteous and you are a beautiful daughter of a king, your behavior will start changing. So your identity determines your behavior. Your behavior does not determine your identity. And that's very often where we get tripped up because we've got the accuser, Satan, that will always say, hmm, you see, look what you did. Hmm? Now you think that you're a child of God. <laughs> and you say sorry, and you, and, you, and you keep thinking, I'm so sorry, I'm such a terrible person. But this is why it's faith. This is why it's a walk of faith. Because despite the fact that we mess up, what is our identity? We are daughters of the king. That is why... It's important for us to believe that we are righteous daughters of the King.
you'll, you'll see more what I, what I mean and why I'm so passionate about this because it's been my life. So, I gave my life to Jesus when I was 12 years old and I can truly say that I was in love with Jesus. I, he was my everything and I only had one dream in my life and that was to be a good wife and a mother. And I went to a co-ed school, so I mixed with boys on a regular basis, but I thought that they were all just too mature for me. So dating was of no interest. I just thought that, oh, you know what, God will bring me my husband at the right time. And um, I just had no interest in, do, in, in dating, which was probably, probably very good for my parents especially. Um, and, but meanwhile, I was dealing with hurtful emotions at home. So my mom and dad loved me. Um, that we had, to, they had four children, but my sister, she was battling with anorexia and bulimia. And so she, when I was 15, she was given 50-50% chance of remaining sane. And so my parents, all of my, my teen years growing up, my parents were doing their very best to try and keep her alive and to obviously make sure that they were doing the right things. So I understood that, but at the same time, how it affected me at home was that I felt insignificant, I felt invisible, I felt that I wasn't important, and I felt that I wasn't heard. So because I thought that every day, and I was experiencing that every day, it became a belief, because through our experiences, we keep thinking the same things, and those beliefs are reinforced. So I started behaving like I wasn't important. I would hide in my room, I'd hang out in my room. I, was, I became a loner. I, was, I did very well at school. I, 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 was, I got colors in academics and sports and I was captains of, of uh, two sports teams, hockey and tennis. And I was even head girl in the trick. But throughout it all, I believed that I was insignificant. I believed that I didn't matter. So I had the respect of students and the teachers at school, but at home, I felt like a nothing. I felt like I, I really didn't matter. So my school responsibilities kept me focused, but this is where throughout my teen years, Jesus and I became very close. And I would journal and Jesus was my best friend. And um, I lived along the straight and narrow, and so, as I said, boys were not an issue, so it was, I, I really just gave my, myself completely to, to Jesus and to church work and school work. But, um, yeah, as time progressed, um, I was now uh, 19, and I still had never been on a date. I didn't know really what men were all about. And um, my mom started thinking maybe I was lesbian. And so I thought to myself, well, now if mom thinks that, then perhaps, you know, other people think that. So I panicked and because my only desire was still to be a wife and mother. And how was I going to find a man if I never dated? And God wasn't popping him in my, in my, in my path. <laughs> so I went on a date. And um, my mom, my mom was she was very good with the way that she brought me up in um, with regards to keeping myself pure. She was very good like that, and she taught me don't kiss a guy full on in the mouth until you're married, don't have sex before you're married, and um, don't let your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, so don't let any man touch your female bits. So uh, that was very good in my mind and very entrenched in my mind. So. Um, the first date, I told the guy that um, I'd never been on a date before and that I was wanting to keep myself pure for my husband. Well, he dropped me off at home and I never saw that man again. <laughs> and <laughs> the second date I went on, um, I'll call his name Victor. And so Victor was strong, he was very confident, and um, he was like a, a small boy in a giant's body. And um, I felt safe and secure with him. And I thought, well, this will, this, this is, this could be a good guy. Well, he kissed me on our first date. And as the on the second date, third date, 
this was happening more and more regularly, and he touched my female bits. And so now I was, I started feeling guilty about myself because the, the way that I'd, um, I knew what I, what I should be doing and my mom had brought me up correctly that way, but I felt terribly guilty. I felt, sh I felt shameful. And I didn't know what to do with my guilt and my shame because I kept thinking I'm bad, I'm naughty, I'm terrible. So that was adding to all of those childhood beliefs that I had about um, I'm a no good, I'm insignificant, I'm unworthy, I don't matter. And that's how I felt before God now. And that had changed my whole relationship with Jesus because he didn't see me any differently, but I saw myself differently. I saw myself as dirty and bad before God. And that was devastating for me, but I didn't know how to fix it. Anyway, my shame grew worse. And um, one night in the bedroom at um, uh, Victor's, Victor was still living in with his parents, and one night in his room, he forced himself on me, playfully at first, but then despite my um, panic of saying, please don't, please don't, please don't, yeah, he ended up penetrating me and I, it was it was like I, um, I felt like I was had been injected with a poison that I couldn't get out, and there was nothing I could do about it. Now I felt like my my life was over because I had tried so hard to keep myself pure all those all those years, and now suddenly I was extra bad. I was extra naughty. I was now definitely not on God's good books, and I didn't know what to do. So I just carried on sh hiding myself from my mum and I felt more and more shameful and I, I started re re uh, retrieving more and more into myself but believing more and more of these thoughts of I'm bad, I'm no good, now not even God's going to accept me. So I dedicated myself more and more to Victor because I thought to myself, well, at least maybe I can fix this. If we get married, then it'll all be okay. Then God will accept me again because I'm only allowed sex when I'm married and that's the way it should be. But if I can fix this and I can keep making this relationship work, then it'll all be all right. And especially because I just wanted to be a wife and mother, I thought, well, then everything will be okay and my, my dreams will come true. So, sadly, Victor didn't treat me very well. Um, yeah, he was always telling me that I was no good. He told me that I was nothing, that I could never do anything right. As our relationship progressed, these, this behavior was just perpetuating itself, and um, I felt more and more worthless. So, because I believed that I was worthless and insignificant and unworthy, and that I didn't matter. I can see now from an outsider's perspective that that's why I, I attracted Victor into my life because all of this treatment that he was giving me felt normal because I believed that I was nothing. I believed I was worthless. At home, I believed I was insignificant and now I had attracted a man that made me feel insignificant and made me feel unvalidated. At home, I felt unvalidated. My thoughts in my head were constantly going around, you're not important, you're not that special, you're dirty, you're bad. And here was Victor and he was treating me like that. So I attracted into my life what I believed about myself. And that's why how we believe about ourselves is so important. So I would find telephone numbers in Victor's pant pockets and I'd phone the numbers and the numbers were girls' numbers. And I would say, who's speaking? Sometimes the girls would answer. Other times they would turn it on me and say, oh, who are you? And I'd put the phone down. And the reason why I did that was because I knew that Victor would then tell me that I was snooping in his pockets and accuse me and then the punishment would be worse. But he punished me in different ways. I never knew what that punishment would be. And 
we did get married. And as our marriage continued, the abuse was worse, became worse and worse. And it was verbal, emotional, and then physical. But the emotional abuse was what hurt the most because nobody could see the scars that he was, he was speaking to me. Every time he said that I could never do anything right, every time he told me that nobody else would ever want me, every time he told me that I was stupid, those words stuck and there was nothing I could do to show anybody how I felt inside. So inside, I was just, um, I was feeling like my heart was mincemeat and yet nobody could see that. I was a manager at work but at home I felt like a slave. Also to make it worse, um, I was his sex toy and I believed that whatever Victor wanted to do to me, with me, because I was his wife, he was allowed to do that. So he watched a lot of porn movies behind my back and so obviously I needed, he wanted me to perform some of these sexual moves. So anything that he, everything that he asked me to do, that he forced me to do, I did because I was his wife. And this just made me feel more and more worthless and just like a piece of meat. So inside me, I was breaking. And I did feel very alone and isolated because people didn't know what was happening at home. So my family didn't know what was happening at home. I couldn't tell them because if they had to even look at Victor in an unusual way, or perhaps not see him in the supermarket, or um, if they just had to just give him a, a casual greeting, I would get the punishment at home because he would say, you've been telling your parents about me. You've been telling them lies about me. What have you been telling them about me? So for friends, to keep friends and family at a distance was the best thing for everybody and for my survival. I knew what time I had to be home. I knew what rules I needed to keep. I knew which friends I could phone. I knew which friends could phone me. So everything was to keep Victor happy. And so that was, um, that was my life. And what, what the sad thing was that because I believed that I had made my bed, now I must lie in it, I believed that I'd made my bed by allowing him to have sex with me before we were married, and so now I must suffer the consequences. Because when you do something wrong, you get punished and you need to get punished. So I deserved, I needed that punishment. And so this, the, my thinking towards God was also something that was like, well, God, I know I deserve this punishment, but please help me. Please help me be a better wife. Please help me to love Victor better. Please help me to love him more. I had been to three different churches um, that I'd had connections with and to been to their eldership to ask their advice as to how do, I, how do I do this right? And in those years, it was in the um, 1990s, that they, abuse was not something that was very exposed. Um, and they, they said to me, I need to love him more. And because if I loved him more, then my love for him would turn him to Jesus. And that was my only desire too. I wanted him to come to know the Lord. He was a Christian, but a, um, a backslidden Christian, if I can say that. Or he was, now I see too, he was just a, a man who was so hungry for God, but because of his brokenness in his life, he didn't know how to love. He said he loved me, but he didn't know how to love because he he was not receiving God's love either. His identity about himself was very bad. So I see that now, and I understood that then, and that's why I kept staying in the relationship because I knew God hated divorce, and I didn't want to fail God any more than what I already had, so I didn't want to get divorced. And I knew that if I just tried to love him more, Perhaps there could be a chance that he could come to know Jesus. Um, 
So I had made a, a real mess of my life. And I, I just started searching for God more. I would journal. He would send me, to, uh, Victor would send me to the spare room regularly as a punishment for something that I'd done that I didn't even know that it was wrong. I'd put the coffee cup here instead of there. And for a split moment, I was in front of the TV and that made the whole evening wrong. He'd swear and tell me, I, why did I do this? Why did I put the coffee cup there? So there was nothing ever that I could do right. So the dogs would hide with me in my room and that's when I would journal between God and myself. And like the Israelites, <laughs> I could identify with them so much of like, Lord, just change me, please rescue me. And I was now desperate to do anything. God, I know I've, I've, I deserve this punishment, but please just get me out of this. And if I had accepted God's love for me and seen myself as God sees me, things would have been very different. But I, my beliefs about myself, my identity was that I was useless. I was worthless, I was insignificant, I was a nothing, and I was dirty and I deserved punishment. But God answered my prayers. <laughs> Lord, change me. He, I don't know if you've ever had an aha moment, um, but my aha, aha moment came through my brother. Um, one day my brother just came to me and he said to me, Chrissy, if I as your brother don't like the way you're being treated, how much more doesn't God? And my brother had, he, him and I are very close. Um, we've got a very special bond because we think very much the same. We've got the same relational gifts. And so he could see that something wasn't right. Every time he'd, um, he'd see me, he would, he would be able to see the pain in my eyes. So when he said that, Chrissy, if I, as your brother, don't like the way you're being treated, how much more doesn't God? It was like something hit me between, between my eyes. I was like, Yo, who do I really believe God is? If my brother and my family knew what was happening behind closed doors, they would be ripping me out of there. They would be wanting me to just get, never go back to Victor. And yet here I believe that God was forcing me to stay in it. So what did I believe? Who did I believe God was? What did I believe about love? Was I willing to accept God's idea of love and believe that, that he really loved me? Or was I going to believe my experience? Who was I going to believe? And that was my question to myself that my brother instigated through that, through that moment. So... I was a wife, but a big part of me was to be a mother. And I had to let that go as well when I realized, well, um, after these incidents during our marriage, uh, the one incident Victor said to me, he, I hadn't menstruated for a while, and he said he thought I might be pregnant. So after a line of questioning, he said to me, I've been, I've been thinking, he said, if you ever fall pregnant, I want nothing to do with that child. And I also will either divorce you or you will have to have an abortion. So that, that shattered me because I thought to myself, wow, I'm not, I'm his wife. And if he can say this, I don't want to have a child. I don't want to be in this environment. So God did save me from that. Um, the other thing that, that Victor said was that he's been thinking, he wants a, this was a few years after this incident, he wants a legal agreement drawn up that if, if I ever fall pregnant, he wants nothing to do with the financial responsibility of raising the child. So these hurts sat, but um, I realized how God just gave me the strength to love Victor but to also to start loving myself and see myself as God sees me. So just before um, 
we do go into our, our tea time. I also want to just let you know that I believe wholeheartedly in marriage. Victor and I did get divorced. I, I left him and I separated from him in uh, 1999 and we got divorced in, in 2000. But I didn't divorce Victor because I didn't love him anymore. And I didn't divorce Victor because I didn't believe in marriage anymore. I divorced Victor because I realized that I didn't want to live anymore. And my, I didn't want to live like this anymore and live a pretense game where every day I was putting a smile on my face, going to work, doing my job, but coming home and feeling like a slave and feeling like, how could, how could I even speak about God's love when my friends could see that I wasn't, I had no idea of what being loved actually looked like? How could I be an example of God's love to other people? And yet I was this mush of mincemeat that could barely say boo or ba because I was too scared to say anything, to do anything. And I, that I made a promise when we got married that I would be with him till death do us part, but that till death do us part part, I wanted that. I, I didn't want to live like this anymore. And through my brother's words, that thought process of then checking what did I believe about God? Who did I believe God was? If my own family who loved me, but not as much as God loved me, if they would have wanted to rip me out of that house, why did I believe that God was forcing me to stay? And obviously every situation is different and my prayer for women that I have counseled in abusive relationships, our prayer is always that God would do a miracle in that relationship. And God's way of doing a miracle is his choice of sometimes he knows, he always knows what is best, but sometimes he knows which direction we would be able to handle. And so for me, it, it was divorce and it wasn't easy. Um, I, I still loved him. And so living in Peter Maritzburg became unbearable because I would hear about the parties he was going to, the girls he was with. So even while we were separated, he was already dating other girls and that broke my heart. So I did, um, in the next session, you'll find out what, um, what we got took me after this. But I want to also say for those single ladies here, through experience, um, through circumstances, single ladies that have sadly been made single through death or divorce, and those that are longing for a partner and you've never been married, Singleness is, is also very special to God. He's, he loves us as women, no matter whether, we're, whether we've seen our identity as being a wife or mother, like I had initially, or whether you now see yourself as a widow, or whether you see yourself as a single person, and that's been your identity. Take heart today, because that's not your identity. That's not your identity. That may be your title, but your title's temporary. But your identity is firmly grounded as a daughter of God. That never changes. Never, ever changes. So be open for what God wants to do in your heart today. If your heart is broken because either you're single and you're longing to be married, or you're single because of circumstances that either through death or divorce, or if you're single because you've chosen to, know that singleness is very important to God because he uses that time for him to teach you 
how to love yourself. Because only if we love ourselves and see ourselves as he sees us, only then can we truly learn how to live as daughters of God. And we can only truly then learn to love others as well. So singleness years are special. And in preparation for this, uh, I was praying for every single lady, every widow. And God just wanted me to share with you that he's got a very, very special place in his heart for you. If you are single and your heart is aching, he does want you to know that he sees that. And you are not unseen. You're not unnoticed. But he also wants you to know that this is a special time for him and you. And that, that's, that's what he considers special. And he just, I got this picture of he just wants to lift your head and point it in his direction. So if you'll be open for the Lord to do that and to minister his love to you, I know he wants to do that. So my last little thing is that God loves us as women. He loves our feminine hearts. And 1 Peter 3 verse 3 to 4 says, let your true beauty come from your inner personality, not a focus on the external. For lasting beauty comes from a gentle and peaceful spirit, which is precious in God's sight and is much more important than the outward adornment of elaborate hair, jewelry, and fine clothes. That's what God loves. That's what he sees. Nobody else sees that. Nobody else can see your mush of a heart. Or if you know if your heart is whole, it manifests after a while on the outside. And I can also testify to that. That um, I didn't always look like this. I consider myself looking pretty good now in comparison to what I used to look like. And that's still a journey which we'll find out um, where my identity was very much in what I looked like because of the anorexia and bulimia with my sister. And my whole journey, the outside mattered, mattered more than the inside. So I stand here wholeheartedly, humbly, and saying to you that I do know that the inside is far more important than the outside and it does manifest on the outside and hopefully I'll even look 10 years younger and I'll look 10 years more beautiful in 10 years time. <laughs>